I'm going to be discussing managing the damaged labrum and using an evidence and case-based approach. So here are my disclosures for starters. And we'll start with some basic anatomy. So what does the labrum do and why should we be concerned about the labrum and the labral tissue? The first thing is it's a suction seal mechanism. Very important for joint nutrition. Secondarily, it helps with articulation, stability, and proprioception. So it's analogous to having a jar of jam or a jar of pickles. When you pop that seal, you lose joint integrity. So having that suction seal is extremely important. When you look at the structure of the labrum, as you can see on the slide, you have very, very interesting blood supply. The blood supply is dominant on the capsular side and thin centrally. Just here, you see the plexus of the superior and inferior gluteal arteries coming together. And the innervation is by the obturator nerve and the quadratus femoris branches. So this audience is aware of this, but it's good to know that the blood supply is very much like the meniscus, very peripheral, and thins out as you get more central. If there's one thing we love in orthopedics, it is classification systems. We are experts at classifying things. So when you have a labral tear, take a look at this. You can classify it by mechanism, whether it's CAM or pincer focused. You can classify it by morphology and MRI, another way to classify labral tears. You can classify it by location on the clock face, another metric of classification. You could even use a combination of many different systems and fuse them into one like the Mahorn group. But it doesn't really matter how you classify a labral tear. Truly, it doesn't. What matters is what you do with this problem in a patient. So you see a patient, symptomatic, having pain, positive arrow sign on the MRI, you figure out that this patient needs an intervention. The next step becomes, how do you help this patient? Which is very important. I think it's important to make sure you're aware of the architecture of the hip joint. Apart from the labral tear that you have, it's very important to assess the bony morphology. And again, this audience knows that, but in a situation where you have a dysplastic hip, you have to worry about coverage. If you have an impinging hip, you're worried about the morphology of impingement damaging your labrum and your cartilage. So really understanding the foundation before you conduct a labral repair is very important. If you don't have a foundation of a good joint, mechanically, biomechanically, you will, may have failure of your labral repair. So understand the background foundation before you press ahead with a labral repair. That'll certainly help you. Some are at the extremes of dysplasia, some are impingers, but most of us on a bell curve sit somewhere in the middle right here with our hips and our morphology. But just be aware there's a range of undercoverage and overcoverage. So how do you fix the labrum? Well, you have a couple of techniques. You have a looped repair where you loop around the labrum or a base stitch technique, which is a vertical mattress analogous uh, stitch. And regardless of what technique you use and how you fix it, as long as you repair the tissue satisfactorily with good technique, your outcomes should be appropriate and just fine. So whether you loop or base stitch, the outcomes are very similar. However, it's important to mention this fact. If you look at the world's literature, and we published this paper with Mark Philippon several years ago, there's a significant difference in the repair versus debridement. So in a situation where you have a clinical scenario, where you have a labral dysfunction or labral tear, it's very key to try and reconstitute the tissue by repairing it. Because comparing, compared to debridement, you have a much better clinically important, relevant outcome with a repair over debridement. So repair is a, a very important step in your soft tissue reconstruction. And then you have this difficult scenario where you have an irreparable labrum. You could see that the articular cartilage is also starting to debond. The labrum is really frayed and you can't repair it. And then you have this scenario where you're thinking about reconstruction and you have to make a decision. Do you reconstruct or do you repair and why? And we'll get into that. The reason is when you have a scenario where you have a dysfunctional labrum that is irreparable, too poorly damaged, poor tissue, you have some considerations to make. <clears throat> First consideration is this. Why did this fail? And Brian Kelly is one of my mentors in special surgery. And when I trained with him, he was very key at driving home this point. Assess every layer of the hip as you're making your decisions. First, what's wrong with a bony structure, layer one or zone one? Do you have an impingement scenario? Do you have a scenario of dysplasia? A combination of that. But assess the bony morphology, that's very important. And don't focus strictly on the labrum. Secondarily, look at the inert layer. What covers the bones? 
capsule, cartilage, ligaments. Ensure you're aware of what's happening with that layer as well. Then as you can move further out, think about the engine of the hip, the musculature. Is that contributing to your failure or difficulty with the clinical scenario? And finally, the neurochemical layer, we are really looking at the soft tissue around the hip, the innervation of the joint, which contributes to how well the uh, joint is functioning. So from top to bottom, think about the bony structure, the soft tissues, the musculature, and the innervation. And if you think about that comprehensively, you'll get a very astute understanding of the problem and how to solve the hip clinical problem. Also, it's important to think with this concept. When you have a patient who you've had who is having a difficult time post-operatively, it usually isn't one thing. It usually isn't bad surgery. It usually isn't a bad patient. It's a combination of factors. So be aware that technique and biology overlap. And a failure of treatment can be a combination of a failure of two or three factors driving your outcomes. So be aware of what causes failure. It's multifactorial. And if you can assess with a systematic, not a dogmatic, but systematic approach, you should solve your problems clinically. So here's a case example. We have a 30-year-old physician, resident, referred for a second opinion because of failed index open surgery. Bilateral hip pain, groin pain, snapping, clicking, popping, unhappy, two and a half years post-operative, and he's here for a second opinion. When you look at the x-rays, you see he's had bilateral open surgical hip dislocations. Well done. We can always criticize our colleagues, but I would say this is well done. Trochanteric osteotomies healed quite well, but he's still here, he's back, and he's having pain, and he's a physician, has to work, needs to work. So what do you do? Go back to that algorithm and look at the, low, the layers and the zones of the hip. So the first thing we think about is, okay, how do we solve this problem? In this case, bilateral hip arthroscopy, revision osteochondroplasty for some slight morphological uh, abnormalities, adhesion resection, psoas lengthening, a bursectomy. Two years later, one hip is doing well, and the other hip still has some difficulty. So you ask the question, why is that happening? So we move on to assessing with a CT scan because of the metal artifact and scatter. And I ask you to look at this and remember this very, very clearly because we'll see it come up again. This is the beginning of labral failure, ossification of the labrum, meaning that you can have a failure of treatment not because of failed technique, but failing biology. And this is a patient who, despite having an osteochondroplasty, a nice head and neck junction, is failing because his biology, his labrum, is no longer viable. And if you look on the MRI, same thing. And we have a diagnosis of pre-arthritis, labral degeneration, and cartilage thinning in a 30-year-old. This is a physician. He does not want to have a total hip replacement. And I don't blame him because I wouldn't want that either. So what do we do? I'll remind you about that spike of bone I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, and you'll see it come back to us. Look at the quality of the tissue here. How can this, and the labrum ossification we saw, how can this hold up a 30-year-old physician, 200-pound ex-athlete? Labral tissue and cartilage tissue completely denuded and also non-viable. So when you have a situation like this, you have to break out your full playbook. This is not so much a failure of technique, but a failure of biology, meaning the biologic substance in the joint is not containing his joint fluid and not giving him the structure he needs. And so we proceed to conduct a labral reconstruction, preparing your rim, preparing your anchors, and anchoring your graft with a 180 repair, reconstruction. So when you think about that, layers. Layer one, non-contributory, as well as three and four, but well, we see a case here of labral failure and cartilage failure. So at the end of this, we also conducted a microfracture to try and stimulate healing. Well, if you break it down by your layers, generally you'll have a nice systematic approach to solving your difficult cases. How about this case? 19-year-old student referred for a second opinion. She's had previous FAI surgery before she came to me, and she had a four anchor repair. She presents with ongoing pain and a 3T MRI labels her <clears throat> hip as having intersubstance labral degeneration with no new FAI disease and no capsular uh, deficiency. And when you look at the layer concept, you can see that layer two is a pertinent layer of concern. Again, labral failure, something we didn't recognize before or we're seeing more recently and understanding uh, more and more. 
So look at her hip at 19, and that's coming up. This is a video by my ex-fellow and I. And look at the labral edema, degeneration all the way through at a 19-year-old's hip. Again, you could put another anchor or two in this hip, but the reality is we have biological failure of the labral tissue, and it's not providing the function that's needed. As a result of that, we proceed on to have a reconstruction. And you can see her tissue just melt away by applying the edge probe onto her labrum. Just simply flakes away. So in this scenario, again, rim preparation, decorticating in preparation for reconstruction, and doing a 180 degree reconstruction, so 180 recon. Sometimes these segmental reconstructions, sometimes 360, in this case 180. And that's because we'd like to provide her with a biology to support her hip. So once you debride the rim, anchor fixation is uh, deployed, we're now shuttling the graft into the joint with my fellow's assistance, and soon we'll have the end result uh, in the next second or two. So this is our 180 reconstruction of the joint, and she's a year post-op and doing very well post-reconstruction. So I think it's important to mention that, you know, in these cases, there's a learning curve, there's some expertise involved, but regardless, if you understand the concepts and go layer by layer, you can really address these difficult cases. Our final example is just to show you integration of labral tissue after reconstruction before we move on to something else. So another 37-year-old in a revision scenario who's having pain post FAI surgery, and you can see the labral tissue. I would argue that this is no longer viable. This is not going to provide her with substantial benefit by anchoring or fixing, and consider a reconstruction in this scenario, from my experience. At the completion of her, three, her reconstruction, you can see the incorporation of her graft into the acetabular rim. So these grafts can actually heal. What about the evidence? That's very important because patients in 2019 are very sophisticated, they're very smart, and they ask tough questions. And so when you talk about the evidence with your patients, you can let them know that at three to four years, there's a 75% survivorship of a reconstruction in the young patients. So the outcomes and the data supports, at least in the short term for now, a reconstruction procedure in a failed scenario, especially in the young patient with minimal degenerative changes and no osteoarthritis certainly a very helpful procedure. So this is the audience poll part of the um, discussion because we have some surgeons here. We see a patient here with a partial thickness labral tear. And look at the size of the labrum. It's hypoplastic. It's about two to three millimeters in size. Can we fix that with anchor technology? I'll ask the audience for their opinions with uh, raising your hands. Who would pursue a, re a repair in this scenario where you have Labral tissue, hypoplasia, two millimeters of a labral cuff to fix in this patient. Any takers on a repair? Reconstruction. Leave it alone. Augment. Okay, so all over the map, but I think the recon slash augment side of things is winning out. And I agree with you because when you look at this quality of tissue in this diagnostic scope, it's the size of the probe and you wonder how much weight-bearing and load-bearing force that can sustain long-term. So I think we really have to have a full playbook when you're handling these cases. 10 years ago, we debride that, cauterize it, and get out. And they may do okay for a year or two, but then they come back to your clinic with more pain. So be aware of the situation where you have a hypoplastic labrum. So we now have a few technical steps to talk about with your reconstructions. Assess deficiency, debride the rim, prepare the rim, and then deploy your graft after anchor fixation. So you know these steps, you're very sophisticated, you've done this before, but this is just the basics as far as your reconstruction. And of course, don't forget layer one with your FAI morphology or dysplasia morphology. I think the future will be debated as to whether we go to direct reconstructions or repair. The jury's still out, but increasingly we're seeing in some cases, we just have to move on to the best logical step for the patient, and that sometimes involves deploying new tissue biologic solution and options for patients who are having difficulties with hip function. So be aware of that, and this paper did conclude that we're now approaching similar results, whether you reconstruct primarily or repair in the setting of a very damaged labral tissue. So I encourage you to have a full playbook when you have a labral tear. Be ready to debride selectively, repair when appropriate, and reconstruct when you have to. And when you have that full playbook and play, uh, option with the patient, 
certainly you'll have no difficulties in managing labral disease. So my approach, which is evidence-guided, is in a scenario where you have a labral tear, especially in a young adult, consider a repair with one anchor per clock face. When you have a 12 to 3 labral tear, three to four anchors to do the trick. So for each spot in the clock face, consider an anchor fixation to really secure that tissue. When it comes to the dysfunctional labrum, it's hypoplastic, be aware of this number of three millimeters or less. If you have that tissue, less of that tissue, or less than that amount of tissue, really consider moving on to your next best step, which is a reconstruction. When it comes to how you reconstruct, autograft, allograft, because of donor site morbidity, be aware of the allograft options and potentials for me. Semi-T or gracilis allografts are very effective in these cases. So really get your hands on that and try to improve your technique if you can. This is easy to pass and been very successful in the literature as well. And finally, be aware of all the prognostic indices that can impact your repair. So if you focus strictly on labral tear and the MRI report and ignore the morphology or the arthritis or the connective tissue disease, then typically your outcomes will not be as good. So consider all those factors as you make that complex decision on how you manage labral disease. So with that, I thank you for your time and welcome your questions. <laughs>